Good morning and welcome to the FSR Advanced Webinar entitled Does Heterogeneity Matter? EU Involvement in Electricity and Natural Gas Transmission Grid Tarification that will be presented today by Sofia Rooster, who is a Research Fellow in the THINK project here in Florence Square of Regulation. My name is Magdalena Mosch and I'm a Training Coordinator here at Florence Square of Regulation. And before we will connect with our today's speaker, I would like to just point out a couple of main issues regarding the webinar agenda. Okay, so the first point is the introduction, and this is exactly what I'm doing right now. Uh, in this point, I will also briefly explain the control panel that you can see right now in the upper right corner of your computer screen. Then we will proceed with Sophia Rooster's presentation. Then there will be the Q&A section. In this section, our today's presenter will reply for the questions submitted by the audience, and I will explain briefly how to submit your questions in just a couple of seconds. And then we will conclude this webinar with some final announcements. Okay, so this is the control panel that you can see right now on your computer screen. There are a couple of uh, tools that I would like to just point out very briefly now. Uh, the first button is to close or open the panel, so this is the orange arrow. Uh, therefore, if you would like to follow the webinar by having your presentation on your full computer screen, then just please click here and uh, then the control panel will be minimized and you will have the presentation on your full computer screen. However, if you would like to check something on the internet or you would like to, um, I don't know, check something maybe on your computer, then you can always minimize the whole webinar and the webinar icon will remain on your taskbar. So in that case, just please uh, click on the button just here below. However, I would like to just point out one issue that I strongly encourage you to, to switch off programs such as Skype or any other program that could interfere with the quality of today's webinar by um, mixing a bit the internet connection. The next button is the hand rise tool that you can see just here below at the control panel. So uh, this is the tool that I would like you to, to use just right now. And therefore, if you can hear me and if you can see my presentation on your computer screen, just please click here and I will know that everything is fine. I will just give you a couple of seconds now to see whether everything is fine. I know that most of you are just clicking. I will just give you a couple of more seconds. Yes, I can see that everything is fine, and thank you very much for very encouraging comments also. Uh, however, if you have any problems with um, technical issues or you would like to submit questions to Sophia Rooster, please use your question box here just below. And Sophia will answer for this question in the Q&A section. However, you can you can submit your question even right now or even after 10 minutes of the webinar, so please uh, do as you wish. And if you have any comments regarding the technical issues, you can also use this box to inform me about it. Okay, so right now we can uh, proceed with the presentation. Let me just point out one issue. Today's webinar is an advanced webinar. Uh, from now on, the FSR webinars will be divided into introductory and advanced. In the advanced webinar, we will uh, present also the results of the FSR's um, research. Uh, today's webinar is the perfect example of that. So this is Sophia. I will try to connect right now to Sophia, and we will proceed with uh, with her presentation. Sophia, can you hear me? Hello, Magdalena. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much, Sophia, for Hello. being here. Right now, I will connect to your computer screen, and we will be able to proceed with your presentation. Yeah. OK, so, I can see the slides. Everything seems to be perfect. If you could do the okay. full screen, then we will know that everything is fine. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sophia. So uh, I leave you the floor, and I will connect uh, to you again in around 45 minutes. Good luck. Thank you very much, Magda. Um, well, does heterogeneity matter? Um, this we will discuss during the next 40 or maximum 45 minutes. Actually, this webinar is based on one of our last think reports where we investigated the EU involvement in electricity and natural gas transmission grid verification. Think, for those who don't know it yet, is a three-year project which is financed under FP7 where we work always six months on a certain topic that always deals with the question on how the future 
energy policy could or should look like and which role the EU or European institutions should play here. If you are interested in reading more about the topic I will present you now, you can also always download the full report from our website. Okay, so let's start now. Um, the starting point for this study was that there is a huge divergence among national regulatory practices regarding the regulation of TSO revenues and also regarding electricity and gas transmission grid tarification in the more narrow sense. And actually this heterogeneity in national or even local transmission tariffs might be an obstacle to competition and adequate investments and this might hamper energy market integration and also the transition to a single European market. And so we did wonder whether there might be a need to adapt the regulation regarding transmission grid tarification and also whether there might be the need for a stronger EU involvement and perhaps even some kind of harmonization. So to illustrate this, the question is whether we can live with a European system where decentral decisions are made on a member state or even on a TSO level or whether in contrast we might need some harmonization on the European scale. You all know that we have uh, 27 member states in the EU and we have more than 35 electricity and also gas TSOs and so we might wonder whether it's a problem that different forms of rate of return or incentive regulation coexist or whether it's a problem that in some countries the electricity transmission tariff is fully paid by customers whereas in other countries also the generators pay part of the cost or we also for instance might wonder whether it's a problem that in some markets location and time signals are provided through the tariff structures whereas this is not the case in other countries. And actually the opposite situation then could be a European energy market where all these decisions are taken centrally and where certain aspects related to the regulation of TSOs and related to grid tarification are harmonized. Um, the analytical frame used to work on this topic involves to find answers to three questions. First, we did ask whether this current heterogeneity does hamper adequate investments. And second, we did ask whether it might also impede efficient competition. If this is not the case, there is actually no problem and we would not have to introduce any changes in regulation and we could go for the solution involving decentralized decision making. But if the answer to one of these questions or even to both is yes, um, then we did ask whether the new legislation in place and existing EU instruments, once they are enforced, might be suitable to support adequate investments and efficient competition. And if the answer to this question is yes, then again we are in the lucky situation that no further changes in regulation are needed. But if here the answer is no, then we did develop some recommendations regarding a renewed EU involvement in this respective area. A stronger EU involvement and harmonization of policies, of course, has both costs and benefits. So on the one hand, benefits might result from the convergence of national policies and also resulting overall economic benefits that can be shared. And also transnational externalities, for instance, can be internalized and so they can be treated much more efficiently. But on the other hand, cost of more harmonization and decision making at the EU level in contrast are related uh, mainly to the difficulty to then take into account the national specificities and also um, you would reduce the competition between alternative policy approaches and so the rational for any EU involvement and harmonization always has to be considered and um, evaluated very carefully and thereby any uh, transnational involvement must be justified um, on the grounds of subsidiarity. So any EU action should only be taken when it's more effective than actions at a national, regional or local level. Um, there are actually shared competences between member states and the EU regarding the achievement of the European energy policy goals according to the Article 194 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. So it's actually legitimate to look at this more closely and to see whether we can benefit from some new EU involvement and maybe even from some further harmonization. But of course, 
there also must be some economic rationals for public involvement that goes beyond the member state level. So this might include, for instance, the presence of externalities, both positive or negative. It might uh, include distributional concerns, which is also somehow related to externalities, because as soon as multiple stakeholders are involved, um, diverging interests always can hamper an efficient um, decision making. And another reason could also be, for instance, the discovery of best practice. And finally, um, decentralized solutions might also fail in implementing the necessary regulatory actions. Um, and the point here is that in many cases, a voluntary cooperation on a regional scale, uh, which targets to solve a specific problem might not be feasible or it might not be credible and so some stronger um, instrument might be needed. In our report we uh, differentiated between three forms of EU involvement. So first we have the possibility to, to define general underlying principles here. The EU does not accomplish by itself, it only frames the policies and actions are still done on a decentralized level. So here the EU provides a basis for a common understanding and also ensures uh, thereby that decentralized regulatory action supports the higher level energy policy goals like for instance the achievement of an internal market. A second form of EU involvement could be the harmonization regarding the choice of regulatory instruments. And here the EU gives very concrete rules regarding the policy instruments, but the implementation still will be under the responsibility of the member states. Such a kind of harmonization becomes especially relevant if a divergence among national regulatory designs impedes the achievement of EU energy policy goals. And um, there's a final possible uh, form of EU involvement, which could be the design and implementation of a single EU instrument. And this is obviously a very strong form of EU involvement. Um, this is actually also only appropriate when the member states can agree on one suited instrument or when individual action just cannot solve a specific problem. An example here could be uh, the EU emission trading scheme. So you see that EU involvement is not only about harmonization and it is also more than just introducing new pieces of legislation. Of course, there are directives and regulations such as the third package or also communications from the European Commission which provide a vision on the future European energy system such as the 2050 energy roadmap. But there's not only the European Commission, there are also other European institutions like ENSO Gas or ENSO E, which are the bodies of the European Gas and Electricity TSOs respectively. And they have the mission to work together regarding various aspects related to market functioning and also energy policy. So they are, for instance, responsible for developing network codes and also regular 10-year network development plans. And of course, there is also ACER, the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators that has been officially launched uh, in March last year and that has its offices in Ljubljana and Slovenia. Three areas of regulatory intervention have been investigated in our report. Uh, first, we have the regulation of TSO revenues that will directly impact the TSO investment incentives and then we have tariff structures for electricity and uh, gas transmission systems and here we talk about the allocation of costs to grid users. During the following 35 minutes I will now go through each of these areas and present the current regulatory practice and also then a discussion of whether a uh, possible heterogeneity in national which might be problematic and then in a last step I will present you our uh, major recommendations regarding the future role of EU institutions. So let's start with the first area. Um, analyzing the regulation of TSO revenues you will find out that uh, there is substantial heterogeneity in the national regulatory practices. So, for instance, regarding general price control mechanisms, various forms of 
of uh, rate of return, price cap and revenue cap regulation coexist. Um, AGEC, which is the predecessor of Acer, published some principles for the regulation of TSO revenues in 2007, I think, but they still leave uh, much room for diversity. And the uh, real-world regulation also typically deviates strongly from standard textbook cases and several modules are combined to address different policy options, uh, objectives. There's also a wide heterogeneity regarding the calculation of the allowed revenue. This concerns first the regulated asset base with its components included and also their evaluation. So for instance, working capital might be included at varying levels, assets under construction might be included or not. And with respect to their evaluation, historic cost or replacement values or a kind of standard cost might be used. And there is also a huge variation regarding the numerous parameters applied like the risk-free interest rates, debt and market premiums, uh, beta factors, taxes might be included or not, etc. And so there is variation in the calculation of the CAPEX, of the OPEX and also of the weighted average cost of capital. Now I have one first question for you where I would like to ask you for your opinion. Um, the question is what do you think which instruments should be used to promote new infrastructure investments? I open the poll now. There are different options among which you can choose. The first option could be the temporary increase in the rate of return and a shortening of the depreciation period. The second option could be uh, the inclusion of assets under construction into the regulated asset base. Uh, another option could be the exemption from regulated third party access or other regulatory provisions like tariff control, public co-funding could be a possibility or also the provision of public low interest loans. So I will give you now some more seconds to vote. We have already 15% 15 of the participants who gave me their opinion. Now we have already 30% and I see the results moving. It's very interesting. They, they actually do still change. Ah, we already have now more than 50% of the participants who gave their opinion. I We'll wait some more seconds until we have nearly all votes. And I will show you the results now. Um, most of you think that uh, you can or you should use a change in the regulation of the TSO revenues to promote new investments, so a temporary increase of the rate of return, for instance, or also the inclusion of assets under construction into the regulated asset base seem to be uh, very prominent tools to promote new investments according to the audience. Public co-funding uh, via grants and contracts, there you are not so much convinced. Well, I will show you now um, what we observe regarding real-world projects. Um, I just closed the poll and now we, we have a look on different examples of recent infrastructure projects and see which measures regulators took to explicitly promote these investments. First example is the BBL pipeline between the Netherlands and the UK. Here uh, the investors got an exemption from regulated third party access. Another example could be a bidirectional gas pipeline in Belgium between Inaten and Opvik. This pipeline has been actually co-funded using public money coming from the European Energy Programme for Recovery. For the electricity cables, Britnet, S-Linked and the interconnector, the investors also benefited from exemptions from certain regulatory provisions. The Nornet cable, in contrast, for instance, was co-financed with public money from the 10E funds and um, uh, the investors also got a low interest loan coming from the European Investment Bank. Also, the gas interconnector between Belgium and the UK has been 
partly financed using a low interest loan uh, from the EIB. The Euskadwar pipeline is an example where the regulators granted an enhanced rate of return to the investors for a certain period of time. Then we have another interesting situation for LNG terminals, for instance. Here the majority of the capacity often is dedicated to the sponsors themselves and some also have uh, complete exemptions from regulated third party access. And the final example could be the HVDC uh, electricity underground cable between France and Spain. Here also the investors got uh, grants and they also got a low interest loan from the EIB. So you can see that there is also a huge diversity regarding the instruments that are used to promote new investments and there's also no standardized set of instruments in every country but the decisions are really taken um, on a case-by-case -case basis. So this all this heterogeneity about which we talked so far uh, problematic and here we first have to ask whether this heterogeneity does hamper adequate investments or distort competition. Well, the answer is probably not, um, because different regulations have their justification in individual sector characteristics and national policy priorities in the historical evolution of regulation and maybe also in uh, regulators' capabilities. And many studies have shown that the key parameters that determine investment incentives are an adequate rate of return, regulatory stability and transparency. And these are all issues that um, national regulators can properly address. The diversity regarding the instruments used to promote new investments actually is even conducive to respond to new challenges because you all know that we are in a very dynamic situation. The future energy system in its architecture and fuel mixes etc. is highly uncertain and so there is not this one size fits all solution to promote investments. But there's one big but, uh, cross-country comparability is very difficult and this might actually hamper the attraction of funds from external investors. But there are several studies that have shown that the investment volumes have to increase substantially if the 2020 and 2050 targets shall be achieved and so external investors might become a very important source of funds in the midterm future. Reflecting on all this, we do see neither the need nor solid justification for an EU-wide harmonization of the regulation of TSO revenues, uh, but uh, transparency is of very high importance, not only to develop a level playing field, but also to attract funds from external investors. And so ACER could play, a here, uh, could play a role here to conduct the benchmarking of national regulation and maybe also to formulate some kind of good practice guidelines. And I want to um, highlight again that, of course, any convergence in the methodologies used to regulate TSO revenues in terms of building the regulated asset base and also in terms of determining the rate of return will help the national regulators to evaluate individual TSO performance. And I have uh, two final remarks. First, the use of public funds and exemptions should be instrument of very last resort, so it has to be avoided that the problem of cost allocation, for instance, is just solved by providing public money. And second, innovative solutions to trigger investments like, uh, for instance, tendering or an EU tariff component need to be um, considered too. Okay, so now we come to the second area, to the electricity transmission tariff structures. Transmission tariffs are an issue that is under the responsibility of uh, member states and TSOs. Um, certain principles have been defined in the EU directives and regulations, so for instance electricity transmission tariffs shall be transparent, they shall not be distance related. But uh, all this uh, leaves much room for an individual design and implementation and so again it's an area where we observe huge diversity. This uh, figure shows you the sharing of network charges among generation and load. So you see that the largest share is typically paid by consumers and this so-called L component 
accounts for even 100% of the transmission tariff in the majority of member states, like for instance in Belgium, Croatia, Germany or Latvia. There are only a few countries that apply also uh, non-negligible um, G component like um, Austria, the UK, Ireland or Norway or Sweden, but of course the absence of such a G charge implies also that you have no possibility to send any signal to the generators regarding their impact on the cost of transmission. In some countries, location signals are provided. Um, in the UK, for example, the G charge, so the transmission tariff that has to be paid by generators in Western Scotland is about 25 euros per kilowatt, whereas in central London, a new generator would even receive money if he would install a new power plant. Uh, the L charge, so the part of the tariff that is paid by consumers, varies uh, in the opposite direction, of course, accordingly, so it's very low in Western Scotland, but it's very high uh, in central London. In Ireland, in contrast, for example, location signals are only used to give a signal to generators, and in many other European countries, as you can see on this figure, um, there are no varying tariffs with respect to the location of the players in the system at all. Transmission tariffs um, can also be used to give a signal uh, regarding the time of the use of the infrastructure. Um, so tariffs might differ between peak, off-peak and shoulder periods. They might differ between season. Um, Portugal is a good example here. So here it's for instance distinguished between peak and off-peak hours and it's also distinguished between winter and summer. So in winter five hours of the day are considered as peak hours whereas in summer only three hours of the day are considered as such. This figure shows the form of the tariff components. So you see that in some countries the transmission tariff is fully paid based on the energy transported. This is the light uh, orange part of the bar. And this means here it's charged completely in the form of euros per megawatt hour of transported electricity. Um, the power related component in contrast um, which is paid in the form of euros per kilowatt uh, of, foot, of, uh, yeah, of foot capacity can actually go up to 75% in some countries like in Germany or Slovenia, but in other countries it's very, very low or even completely absent. And now I have a second question about which I would like to ask you your opinion. So what do you think? Which cost components are actually included in electricity transmission tariffs? Uh, you can again select multiple options. I will open the poll now. Um, one option could be that electricity transmission tariffs contain the cost for making the infrastructure available. They might contain the cost for losses, the cost for balancing services, or maybe even charges covering expenditures for renewable support, or maybe even some other charges. You can do it now, so please choose if you want uh, more than one option. So what do you think which cost components are actually included in electricity uh, transmission tariffs? We already have about half of uh, the audience who gave uh, their opinion. And uh, it's a very colorful uh, result I see here on my, on my screen. It's a bit as heterogeneous as what we observe in reality. Um, so we now have already 70%. I give you some more seconds to vote before I will show you the results of this uh, poll. Okay, so I will close it now. And you see that uh, nearly all of you, but not all of you, which is a bit surprising, chose the first option, so uh, electricity transmission tariffs, you think that they include the cost of making the infrastructure available, also the cost of losses regarding charges covering renewable support, um, there's a 
smaller share of the audience who thinks that these components are included in the transmission tariff. So let's see uh, what we actually observe in the real world. I close the poll now. And this figure shows you which cost components are actually included in the electricity transmission tariffs in the different member states. Um, you see that actually all these different options among which you could choose before uh, might be included. So always you will find the cost for making the infrastructure available and also cost for losses. In most cases also some cost for system services and in some cases also other regulatory charges like for instance charges which cover the cost for renewable support policies. And you can see in this figure that all dimensions differ among member states, not only the actual cost components included, but also their relative shares in the total tariff and also the tariff level. And in Denmark and uh, Portugal, for instance, as you can see here, these other regulatory charges represent even about half of the total transmission tariff expressed in euros per megawatt hour. And all this heterogeneity obviously makes cross-country comparisons uh, very difficult. So does the current heterogeneity uh, regarding electricity transmission tariff structures hamper adequate investments or distort competition? Here the answer is probably yes. Um, first, transmission tariffs should be allocated as far as possible based on the principle of cost causality and this is not only important regarding fairness but also for economic efficiency and this then also implies that transmission tariffs should be able to transfer allocational signals since the network costs um, in the 2020 and 2050 context will strongly depend also on the location of generation and load. But we saw before that uh, only very, very few countries have actually already uh, implemented some form of locational signal. And of course, if this G charge, so the part of the tariff that is paid by generators, is very low or even completely absent, um, you do not have the mean to set any incentives uh, to generators and you also cannot obviously implement any uh, location signals here. We also saw that the large share is typically charged based on the energy transport what can actually distort the short-term behavior of good users if these costs do not reflect the short-run marginal cost of transmission. And finally, there's also heterogeneity regarding the cost components included, which does hamper transparency. So, are new legislation in place and existing EU instruments suitable to support adequate investments and efficient competition? Probably not because all these issues uh, are not yet adequately treated in the legislation and initiatives we have so far. So we have three major recommendations. First, transparency needs to be increased, which implies that it should be clearly defined which cost components transmission tariffs should contain. Second, it has to be avoided that transmission tariffs interfere with the competitive sector, so one should limit the share paid in the form of euros per megawatt hour, so by energy transported in the tariff covering the infrastructure cost, because a charge um, which is uh, charged in this form always only should cover short run marginal cost, but the cost of infrastructure, for instance, are of course long term costs. So, um, to avoid distortions in competition, uh, a different form of uh, electricity transmission tariffs would be better suited. And finally, the costs should be allocated as far as possible based on the principle of cost causality. So, locational signals should be introduced especially to new generators and this obviously also implies that a minimum G charge has to be applied. I hope that you are all still fresh. We now come already to the final part of this webinar and we will now talk about uh, gas transmission tariff structures. 
actually very similar questions will be asked as in the previous discussion on transmission tariff design for electricity, but the answers might differ as you see because these two commodities and their markets beside many similarities are actually very different. So what can we say about the current regulatory practice? In the European gas sector, we have a harmonized model of tarification. So the third package sets the rules for an EU-wide decoupled entry exit system. So we have several market areas with one single price within these market areas. And shippers can book the entry and exit capacities independently from each other. But uh, there is a huge heterogeneity regarding the stage of implementation and also regarding the concrete design of this entry-exit system. And this actually creates some obstacles to efficient trade and functioning competition. So one first issue is that the flexibility of the decoupled entry-exit system is reduced. So first of all, some countries still do distinguish between domestic transport and transit. But actually this problem won't be uh, there anymore once the third package is fully implemented because these point-to-point uh, -point contracts, which are in some cases still used for transit flows, won't be allowed anymore. So this, this problem is actually solved. But there's a second issue. The size of many market areas is determined based on administrative and political borders. And so some of these market areas are of a suboptimal size. And this has a negative effect in terms of higher transaction costs, especially if the traded products uh, or tariffs uh, are incompatible. And traders also face the problematic of uh, contractual pancaking if they have to go through more uh, market areas than they probably might have to go through if the market areas would have their optimal size. Only some member states, like the UK for instance, have introduced transmission tariffs that are differentiated by location. This is less consequential for smaller price zones, but if you have a well interconnected system with several alternative supply sources and maybe even some flexibility in the flow directions, you would highly benefit from locational signals here. There's also heterogeneity regarding the breakdown of costs between the entry and exit points. So a number of countries just apply, for instance, a sharing rate of 50 to 50. Belgium, in contrast, only allocates fixed cost um, to the entry points. And the Czech Republic um, actively wants to promote imports and market entry. And so they did determine an entry exit split of 22 to 78. And finally, there is also heterogeneity regarding capacity products offered and their pricing. This concerns short-term capacities, interruptible capacities, uh, non-physical backhaul capacities, which are the, those which go into the opposite direction than uh, physical flows, and also the pricing um, structures which are applied here are really heterogeneous among all the member states and even within member states among the different market areas if you have more than one market area in a member state. This figure shows you the form of the tariff component and similar to the electricity transmission tariff, a certain part is uh, paid based on the contracted capacity with uh, some countries also buying an energy related component. So for instance in Austria, Denmark or Hungary um, about 25% of the transmission charges are paid by energy transported in the form of euros per megawatt hour. And it's again um, not obvious which cost components are included in these tariffs. So if you take, for example, the fuel gas that is needed in the compressor stations to enable the transportation of gas, it might be included in these transmission tariffs or there might be a separate charge, or shippers might have to directly compensate the respective volumes, as is the case, I think, in Italy, for instance. So does this current heterogeneity hamper adequate investments? Probably not. Uh, the major challenge here is that uh, we have a substantial uncertainty about the future role of gas in a decarbonized economy. There are some people that currently talk about the golden age of gas, others are 
a bit less optimistic. So the key issue is really to get downstream utilities involved in the realization of large-scale supply infrastructures. We also have typically contractual rather than physical congestion within Europe. And uh, the gas sector is also less complex than the electricity sector in a sense that uh, the commodity flows can be measured and controlled. And this makes bilateral and multilateral agreements actually much easier. Uh, and in addition, also the issue of supply security, uh, for instance, seems to be quite well treated. But does the current heterogeneity distort competition? And here the answer is probably yes. Um, first of all, we have these more than 30 entry exit zones or market areas with mainly administratively and not economically or technically determined borders. And so they are not all of an optimal size and the process of uh, merging market areas continues to be an issue. And uh, the existence of this large number of price zones also implies the problematic of contractual pancaking for long distance uh, transmissions where a shipper who wants to deliver gas from a field in the North Sea to the south of Germany, for example, has to pass through three or four market areas, which means that several times he has to book entry and exit capacities and he has to make all these contracts, uh, etc. And um, there are also some other obstacles to efficient competition. So, for instance, there is uh, the concern of inefficient pricing for short distance transport, also for short term capacity products. There is this problematic of contractual congestion, the lack of capacities into the opposite direction than physical flows. And there is also still a limited compatibility of capacity products offered, which might lead to a kind of capacity hoarding of the shippers at the interconnection points. And now I have a, a final question where I would like to ask you for your opinion. So do you think that the current legislation in place and existing EU instruments, once they are enforced, are suitable to support adequate investments and efficient competition? I open the already now. Um, you can choose among one of these four options. So either you might think that yes, this is the case or well, it's a step into the right direction, but further action is needed. You also might answer no, not at all, or if you don't know, you just uh, choose well, I don't know. And we already have four, more than yeah, nearly half of the people who, who voted, already 60%. And there is a clear tendency towards, uh, towards one answer. I will show you very soon. Um, we have now over 70% of the people who already gave their opinion. And I think this is enough. So I will now close the poll and show you the result. Um, and you see that uh, two-thirds of the audience took the the kind, uh, a bit optimistic, but still a uh, careful answer. Yeah, they are in a step into the right, into the right direction, but further action is needed. Um, only some of you think yes, absolutely. Others think no, not at all. Um, so let's see what uh, we thought about that. Um, I'll show you now. Uh, what the current state of the legislation and existing EU instruments regarding the gas transmission grid tarification is. Um, at the beginning of the webinar, I talked about three different forms of uh, EU involvement, the definition of general underlying principles, the harmonization with respect to the choice of instruments and an EU instrument itself. Um, we have some uh, general principles defined, for instance, regarding the tariffs for network access. So they shall be transparent, they shall be applied in a non-discriminatory non manner. We also have some general principles for capacity products offered. So TSOs shall provide, for instance, both firm and interruptible capacities, also both short and long-term services. And we also have some voluntary guidelines of good practice for example, on the use of exemptions, but they are really voluntary, so we do not have to, to follow them. 
we have a harmonized uh, instrument in the sense that we have a harmonized uh, scheme of tarification, this entry exit system, and also the possibility to give exemptions to new infrastructures from tariff control. And finally, regarding a new instrument, we do not have one yet. So you see, um, the current legislation in place is not yet sufficient to address all the obstacles to efficient competition that I have discussed before. And so we now come to the recommendations for a slightly renewed EU involvement. First, the EU should set the principles for determining the ideal size of entry exit zones, but it should let the concerned national regulators and tiers also agree on the result and the further merging of market areas always needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis because there is a trade-off between the benefits and costs of increasing market size. On the one hand, a larger price zone has several advantages, like for instance an increase in market liquidity or a decrease in price distortions due to pancaking, but on the other side, larger price zones also have disadvantages, so intrazonal constraints are not subject to different prices anymore, and also the free allocation of capacities might become problematic, which actually we saw uh, in the case of past mergers of market areas in Germany. Uh, second, the rules which are already defined in the third package need to be enforced and uh, proposed, the proposed network code on capacity allocation mechanism n needs to be implemented because this will already remove some of the problems related to, um, for instance, the incompatibility of capacity products offered or inefficient pricing. And so <coughs> many of the problems we have regarding efficient competitions would already be solved if this would be properly implemented. And third, ASA should formulate some kind of good practice guidelines. Um, so the entry exit charges should be as cost reflective as possible. So one should, for instance, encourage adequate discounts on very short distance transports to avoid that the domestic customers kind of cross subsidize transits. And one also should, uh, yeah, avoid an asymmetric reallocation of costs to captive domestic customers if you build a new interconnector, for instance. Um, locational signals should be introduced where this is appropriate. And uh, finally, the commodity-related components should only reflect short-run marginal cost. And they, of course, also should only contain cost elements that are related to the transmission activity. I know that this was now quite a lot of information, so we have two final slides to summarize and to conclude. Um, three areas of regulatory intervention have been investigated, the regulation of tiers or revenues and then the transmission tariff structures for electricity and uh, gas. Um, the recommendations in a nutshell were for the regulation of tiers or revenues that there is no need and also no solid justification for an EU-wide harmonization. But benchmarking of national practices through ACER should be done to increase transparency and also innovative solutions to trigger investments um, should be considered. Regarding electricity transmission tariffs, it should be clearly defined which cost components should be included here. Um, the cost should be allocated based on the principle of cost causality, introducing also some locational signals at least to new generators, so also of course some minimum G charge needs to be applied and one should limit the charging in the form of use per megawatt hour if the costs do not reflect short run marginal cost. And regarding gas transmission tariffs, uh, the principles for determining the ideal size of market areas uh, should be um, determined uh, by the EU, but then the concerned regulators and TSOs should decide on how to merge market areas. The breakdown of cost uh, should be done in a cost-reflective way, and again, Acer could formulate some kind of good practice guidelines here. And finally, I would like to say that uh, this work has highly benefited from all the discussions with numerous people. So we had our industry council meeting, 
Then we had a scientific council meeting and not to forget also many informal exchanges with people from academia, from regulators and from the industry and also during the public consultation. We got a lot of feedback. Um, the official responses from Acer and Suyin and Sugas you can also find as annexes at the end of the project report. And we also uh, are very happy that we have been invited to present the major results at the 21st Madrid Forum, which is the European Gas Regulatory Forum earlier this year. And I now thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the Q&A section and I would give the microphone back to Magdalena. Thank you very much, Sofia, for your excellent presentation. And now, very quickly, we can proceed to the Q&A section because we are running out of time. And yeah. let me just say that there were many questions submitted by the audience, so I'm very happy about that. But I just uh, would like to say that we won't have time to answer for all these questions. Therefore, if you have any uh, questions to Sofia, you can always use the email that you can see right now on your computer screen and contact her directly after the webinar. I I'm sure, Sofia, you won't mind to, to answer yeah. for these questions. <laughs> No, no. <laughs> okay, so let me just ask you uh, the first question submitted by the audience. Uh, is pancaking in the gas sector a serious problem? Um, well, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, for that question. Um, the term pancaking is used to describe this phenomenon that gas is typically transported over longer distances and that the transmission tariffs for all the entry exit areas, for all these market areas it passes and are summed up. And people often see this as a problem, but here gas is clearly different from electricity. One first has to say, and the transport costs depend on the distance over which gas is transported. And so adding up the transmission tariffs for the different market areas to say does make sense. Um, this price pancaking would be also unproblematic from an economic perspective as long as charges are cost reflective. But in reality, this is not exactly the case because tariffs might be slightly above the true cost to ensure cost recovery and they might also include some socialized costs not reflecting the, the shippers' real grid use cost. And um, then there is a second type of pancaking about which I talked also during the presentation, this contractual pancaking. And this is a bit more problematic because shippers need contracts over the whole transport route and this becomes very complex if you have to pass through many market areas. But this is a discussion where I would refer to this uh, to the um, discussions which are ongoing on the gas target model because this is uh, treated in depth uh, here and I also can provide further literature on that if somebody is particularly interested. Okay, so the next question has uh, actually two parts, but it's, it's a very good question, so uh, let me try to, to ask you this one. Uh, why should new infrastructure investment be promoted? Isn't the standard TSO regulation enough? Well, sometimes it's not enough. Um, actually, you, this might especially be relevant if you have strong externalities. So if you have, for instance, an investment in an electricity cable, which is in Germany, where we need to strengthen this north-south route, um, to, which would benefit whole Europe. In, a, in an extreme case, maybe it would mainly benefit Denmark and Italy, but in Germany the investment would have to be done, and this might be a, a case where just uh, where the German TSO just does not have an incentive to, to invest, and probably uh, with a normal rate of return scheme you would not get the infrastructure built, but uh, some public money in this case might be needed or some mechanism to allocate the cost to the beneficiaries which might be in another country. Okay, and now regarding the gas tariffs, what does it mean the inefficient pricing? Um, this is a discussion which is ongoing since a while and where there are very different opinions. So um, it mainly concerns the short-term products at the border between two uh, market areas because the prices here might be too high or too low. And actually you have a core problem during off-peak periods because if here the minimum bidding price in a capacity auction is too high, this would impede traders to participate in the short-term trade, but if it's too low, then cost recovery cannot be uh, ensured. And we actually saw this, for instance, in the UK 
where um, the short-term capacity auctions have a minimum bidding uh, price which is uh, discounted. So I think the day ahead it's about 30% of the normal one-year contract and for within-day auctions I think it's, it's even 100% discount. Um, but the past has shown that the demand for long-term capacity is actually elastic and so in the UK they saw a shift from long-term towards short-term bookings um, which resulted in a quite substantial under-recovery of TSO revenues and now this is corrected by just adding an extra commodity charge on all entry tariffs and uh, I talked before also about this problematic of having charges in the form of per euros per megawatt hour, which is here the case, which do not reflect short-run marginal cost, which is here the case, and this therefore creates additional distortions in, in gas trade due to this commodity charge, which does not reflect any short-run marginal cost of system operation, and also this new network holding capacity allocation mechanisms um, discusses this issue and actually proposes that um, multipliers higher than one for short-term capacity auction minimum prices compared to an annual product should be uh, should be applied. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's help. Uh, right now the, the last question because we are running out of time unfortunately and the last question will be to which players should be locational signals provided? Um, yeah. It's also a good question actually at other presentations. I also was already asked exactly this question. We saw during the presentation that only some countries um, have locational signals for both electricity and for gas. Um, in gas, as I said before already, it's less consequential for smaller price zones, but it might be important, especially at entry points, which uh, can be congested in a well-interconnected system where you have several alternative supply sources for electricity. Um, location signals, of course, should be sent for sure to new generators. Um, for existing generators, they will not have a direct impact because uh, their power plants and also the respective grids, they are already there and the, these investments are sunk in nature, so they cannot be undone and as it cannot be removed. But actually also here, locational signals can have an impact um, on existing generators once they come to the end of their economic lifetime and they can incentivize actually a relocation of the power plant for portfolio in the longer run. Um, location signals obviously will have a limited impact on consumers which um, where, where time signals might be much more relevant in order to better account for the utilization pattern and to reduce overall peak, time, uh, peak um, demand. Um, but still the impact will remain quite limited here because um, the transmission tariff is only a very small share of the overall charge they pay for their energy and uh, also demand elasticity is quite low. But summarizing, new, new generators are of course the key target for location signals. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sophia. It's time to say goodbye. <laughs> Therefore, I have to conclude today's session. So thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, I hope that the audience liked your presentations as much as I did. Um, and therefore, okay, so thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Magda. Thank you, everybody, for attending this webinar. Okay, and right now I will come back to my computer screen very briefly just to, just to conclude the session. And yes, I think that you can see right now my presentation on your computer screen. Uh, okay, so let me just conclude this session with just some final announcements. And here we are, so the conclusion. The first announcement is that right after I will close this webinar, automatically on your computer screen will appear a survey. This survey is consisted of eight questions and uh, I strongly encourage you to fill out this survey because this will help us to evaluate this session, uh, to evaluate the content of this presentation and also to make some improvements in our future events.
Okay, the next webinar will take place on the 25th of September at 11 a.m. Therefore, we will have three months break in providing the webinar, but I hope that you will have time in September to join us. And this webinar will be entitled The Offshore Grids and Assessment of the Current Regulatory Frameworks for this investment. And the presenter of this webinar will be Leonardo Meos, a research fellow and scientific coordinator of the THINK project in Florida School of Regulation. And I want to welcome, I want to invite you to, to participate in the webinar also now and it will be possible to register to this webinar tomorrow already tomorrow on our website so this is the FSR website uh, there is a training section and under the section there is a webinar part uh, therefore if you are looking for some further information regarding the webinars that will take place in autumn 2012 just please uh, visit our website I also would like to invite you to to watch our uh, new videos the monthly interviews and uh, maybe also download some of our publications from the website Okay, and however, if you have any questions regarding the webinars, technical issues, or you would like to ask me some other questions regarding other trainings, just please use the email that you can see right now on your computer screen. However, if you have questions regarding the content of today's presentation, please contact uh, Sophia by using the email that you can see right now on the computer screen. Okay, so, uh, well, we are running out of time, and I would like to thank you very much for being here today with us, and I also want to use this opportunity to wish you a wonderful summer break, and I hope that you will join us in the new academic year. Uh, therefore, have a wonderful day, and goodbye. <laughs>